Sound Speeds, and welcome back to Speed Bumps. This is episode 29. 29. 29 years. 29 episodes. I remember when I was 29. I remember when I was two. I don't remember yesterday and what I had for dinner, but I can remember when I was two. And, I, I, you know, it's really weird because I actually have one memory that I know absolutely was the 1970s. And that was, um, I was like three years old, and I was playing with one of my Christmas gifts, which was this Evil Knievel motorcycle stunt kit thing. It was like you'd rev this thing up, and you press the button, and the little motorcycle would shoot out and go. It had a little flywheel type thing on there, and that thing would get going, and it would, it would, you know, mow down anything in its path. And it would, as it was trying to crawl over it and jump off of it. It was pretty cool. I love that thing, but. I remember someone saying in the room that I was in, I can't believe tomorrow it's going to be the 1980s. That's why I know it was 1979 because it was the last day of the year in 1979. That's why I know. Um, now, I do have, have, have memories also of my great-grandfather who passed away in 1978. I remember him, but I don't remember that as being the 1970s. I just remember that being when I was a childhood, you know, when I was a child. Because I remember him. I remember how he never gave me the time of day because he was always so busy reading his book and, you know, y'all don't need to hear stories about, you know, 1970s and family, whatever else. Uh, there's been no changes to the setup. Still the um, Insta360 X3 and 5.7K mode. I'm going to continue to do that for the rest of this uh, year and the Speed Bumps podcast this year. I'm also going to be doing the same thing sound-wise with the BPTRX from Deity uh, using the um, Deity WLAB Pro uh, for sound. So I'm not going to even bother saying it the rest of the year uh, and the rest of the, the season. Let's just assume going forth that if there's any changes, that's uh, that's the base ground. That's what I'm going to be doing. I like the, the system I have in place where I record record everything the way I record it, and then I get it into post and do with it what I need to. So, works well. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get right into our first topic. If you're in production sound, and after the past couple episodes, you've started to wonder if I really do care about getting good sound anymore because I've done a couple of rants about letting things go. Oh, absolutely. I still very much care about sound and stuff. It's just that sometimes, you know, when you're only one of three people that care about sound on set and everyone else is there for picture and it's a big budget show and you have to really do, you know, you have to make decisions that sometimes don't make waves. Sometimes you have to make waves if, if it means saving the tracks. But if you have decent enough lofts, sometimes decent enough is good enough when you have a really good post department. But I mean, it's by no means what we would want to have happen, and and as long as there's some sort of prep in the, in the the world of your production, and and people and their expectations are met, and people know that you're going to always do what you can, but if there's a situation where you are fighting, and uh, it's at sunset and they're trying to get a shot done, otherwise you're not going to make their day, and they're going to have to go all the way back out there to that location again then you're probably going to lose. And it's better for you to not really be a stickler about wanting to wait until this little sound in the distance that you don't know when it's going to shut off. You know, when when that sound happens to shut off, it could be, you know, 30 seconds, it could be 10 minutes, but if sun's setting and it's golden hour and they're literally going to lose the light and, and it's going to go, uh, camera settings are going to go from wide open on the... Uh, digital camera, you know, something that's really good at exposing light and stuff like that, and it's already wide open because the sun is set, you're going to lose this battle if uh, if uh, you try to fight for it. But, you know, absolutely. I, I understand being diplom diplomatic and being able to acknowledge when there is a, a, a concern from production. But, and that's where I'm going with this whole thing, is to when to shut down a camera. Because... There's been a lot of question that people will ask me sometimes in a live stream. They'll ask me sometimes in person in the classes I teach. When do you shut down a camera? How do you know when to shut down a camera? Well, it's actually pretty simple. And the camera you shut down is also simple. If you have a wide and a tight, you do not want to shut down the tight. You want to shut down the wide. But you can't because 
that would prevent you from getting the tracks on the boom when you get back to the to the wide. I mean, wide shots are not what any boom operator wants to see. However, that said, you want them to get all the wide shots that you cannot boom or any shots you can't boom out of the way and out of their system so that way you can concentrate on the stuff you can boom. That's plain and simple the way it is. You don't want them to have to resort to, to wide shots for anything. You know that the coverage is going to play right here. The whole show, the whole movie is going to basically play, take place in the close-ups. But if they got to do a wide shot, let them get them all out of their system and do all the wide shots at the same time. Because if they do that, then hopefully what they'll do is they'll get it and then you can move on to do coverage. But when they do wide shots at the same time as coverage, that's when there's an issue. So you may say, all right, well, just why can't we just shut down the wide shots and then just, you know, do nothing but tights all day? Because they're going to have to do the wide shot anyway. Another note on this is that wide shots take longer for them to set up because there's more elements in it. You have to worry about background. You have to worry about everybody basically going into a particular, you know, scene and, and, and shot. And everybody is going to be participating in that to try to get uh, all the elements from props to lighting and everything, uh, you know, satisfied on camera to make sure you got those shots. Because if you if you have a, a wide shot, you can't get lights on stands next to the actors. You have to put them hidden someplace and you have to, to light the room totally different. And then once you get out of the wide shots, then you can punch in. But sometimes... Those lights that you would add when when you tighten up, they'll sometimes, sometimes DPs will say, we're just going to keep the same lighting because it matches. Sometimes they'll make changes and kill little, you know, downward facing lights in the ceiling that are driving everybody crazy because uh, it's, it's adding, you know, downward facing shadows, but they need them to fill up the room. And boom operators hate them because anytime you you have a room full of these little can lights in the ceiling, you try crossing one or two of those things, you're going to add a, a, a faint shadow across someone's face. So it's really annoying. But, you know, hey, it is what it is, right? But when it comes down to a boom operator and what we're trying to accomplish, getting great sound, the best sound possible, if you have wide shots on one camera all the time, then you're probably gonna have a difficult time shutting them down constantly and consistently because they want to constantly run a wide shot. And the reason for that may be that they get gold on a tight on a tight shot and they say, well, we might wanna cut out to a wide to see what's going on with that shot at the same time. Because maybe it's an action sequence and someone runs around the court and they yell a line right as something explodes. And they say, oh, that timing was brilliant. Let's, let's start doing wide shots at the same time. That way, if someone says the line and they scream it, then at the same time behind them when the explosion goes off, the little particles and the smoke and that kind of thing will match. Well, that's a specialty type situation. You end up running into those kind of situations all the time. And someone's gonna say, well, you know what? Let's, you know, these this wide and the tight camera, those are working really well. But quite often you, if there's nothing to match on a wide versus a tight except performance, no camera move or anything, then what's to say that you can't just uh, shut down a wide shot or a tight shot, you know, when the time permits. What I will usually tell people if I need to shut down a camera is can we go ahead and get the wides done? Because like a DP, for example, if there's a wide and a tight going on, I'll, I'll usually approach them as soon as we rehearse and I'll say, got a question for you. Do we owe more wide shots than this one right here? And if they say yes, then I'll say, is it possible for us to shoot the wides at the same time together? And that way, once we punch into coverage, I don't have, we don't have wides, go, wides going on at the same time as coverage. And they'll usually think about it for a second. As long as there's not a lighting reason or a special effects reason or something like that, uh, then, then they'll sometimes say, yeah. I mean, if it's, if it's a wide shot and then they look back and do a second wide shot the exact other direction, 180 degrees, obviously it's not going to happen. But if you have a wide shot going in this way and a wide shot going in this way and they can add a light, you know, a hair light coming back and, and split the difference on the two and it looks good, then they may say, you know what, we can. Let's do that. But you don't want to shut down the wides in lieu of the tights because you're going to have to go back and do the wides at some point. Now, some mixtures I've worked with have been fairly in unrealistic about their expectations. And I can honestly say that because I've worked with multiple mixtures at this point, mixtures that are very 
uh, that understand the game, that understand the way things need to be, they will be the, the first person to tell you, you know what, let them have their wide shot, and we're going to go ahead and just play that on the wires. And I know that this is going to be at the same time as a piece of coverage or, or a shot, but we'll probably we'll, we'll get this, you know, 15 different ways. And they're, they're right because, you know, you end up spending all day on a scene or two and, and you're going to end up shooting it multiple different ways, multiple different sizes. You're going to get that shot on coverage. Now, if you have three cameras or something and you're always doing at least one wide shot and you're concerned about trying to get it tight, one thing you can always ask is, and this, this doesn't work on all budgets of shows, it doesn't always work on all productions, but you can sometimes say is if you get you know, after a take or two, you could go and talk to the director. If you get what you need to out of this wide shot in a take or two, might we be able to shut it down and give me a fighting chance of the coverage? Or if we get the what we need to out of the wide shot, can I maybe get one one of these tights? You know, that way you can still get at least one on the boom. And that kind of thing may come into play if you are only doing one um one piece of coverage at the same time as a wide shot and they're like ah we're not going to ever get this actor again we're going to go ahead and do like the the actor in the background that only has two lines and you got them on a, a close-up shot while while you have a wide shot in the foreground and they're standing up and they're not wearing a shirt and it's just it's difficult for whatever reason and they're off of the background in that case you got to put a boom on them because there's no other way to do it and if they're doing constant you know moving shots you can't do something like the invisible invisible boom trick to try to squeeze a boom in there to make sure you get it you can't do that on a on a ridiculously you know wide shot where they're not wearing a shirt and they're walking around there's no place to put a plant and anything you try to do is it's gonna sound weird i mean now sometimes you're on a show and they may say you know what we'll just go ahead and put a plant on them hide the transmitter hopefully so that way we don't see them when they when they turn and walk to the side you know when they walk out or when they walk in and what we'll do is we'll just uh if you can try to tape it someplace we'll just make a note and we'll vfx it out sometimes shows will do that and and that's like okay well you know hey that's fine sometimes that's all they'll be willing to give you is vfx on those bigger shows and hey you know what as long as you get your sound you get your sound as ken strain says you know the lob gets the dialogue but the boom captures the performance and that's that's the honest truth of it you can get sound it's I, I mean when people have told me in the past you know can't you just play the lob on this and i'll i'll sometimes say you know uh, you know something like i can but that's like doing coverage with a gopro because you could get it you could you know the color science and the whatever is you know it's going to be grainy grainy and the quality's not going to be nearly there that's the equivalent of using a lob in my opinion uh for coverage is you know i mean uh, can we just shoot the coverage with a GoPro as opposed to with the Area Alexa, you know, 70 mil or something like that, or 70, yeah, something like that. But, you know, hey, the main the main point I'm trying to make here at Drive In is that when you have to shut down a camera is usually if there's a specialty type situation. If someone isn't wearing a lob, if someone's standing up and you can't put a plant on them, if there's uh, sunset and you, you're just going to have some sort of issues, one thing you might be able to do is get the same, uh, the, 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 you might convince them to do a, uh, a take as just the tight because if they like the way it's going to be, you might be able to shut it down after, after all of them and say, can I just get one on the coverage? Or they may say no. And, and it's at the end of the day. And as soon as the sun sets, that's it anyway. And as soon as they no longer have the, uh, the, the light enough to expose, the film or video, whatever you're shooting on, sometimes you can say, you know what, uh, right before you call wrap, since you're only in like a 10 hour day or whatever, could, uh, you know, or maybe even a 12, you can say, can I just get those two lines wild real quick? They might give those to you. So, you know, hey, you kind of, you, you take what you can and do what you can, but on some shows, the show is not going to be receptive to shutting down a tight shot so they they could get the wides and then allow you to get to get the coverage separately sometimes they say no i'm sorry we're just gonna you're just gonna have to get what you can get and if you have any questions about what kind of production you're on ask the mixer mixers will usually know and tell you if they want you to fight for something some mixers are going to say yeah always fight for it even when you know for a fact that 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 it's going to be a losing battle because production has uh has already told you i don't care about this right now i'm just trying to get the shot before sunset and the mixer says well i do care so you're gonna have to push uh, harder and you're like 
I've just lost the first AD. I've just lost the producers. I've just lost the director. No one is going to be on my side anymore in fighting for this. And you're telling me to push this to the point where I'm going to be in trouble. And some, some mixers are not realistic about, about things and will have no problem throwing their teams under the buses to do something like that. Something you got to be aware of out there as a boom operator. You're going to end up having to make your mixer happy by making sure that everyone on set around you is is annoyed by you. But hey, you know, you got to figure out whether or not it's uh, worth keeping your job over or uh, are you going to diplomatically approach it or to see what you can do. Every single take, try something different. Try a longer shotgun try, uh, as a plan someplace or, you know, what have you. But when it comes down to shutting down a camera, can you do it? And those are the, the tools to have in your arsenal and the things to think about when you're doing so. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you've probably seen my video, which got second place in the Sound is Essential contest that Electrosonics ran in, I think, 2021? No, it was 2020, wasn't it? Because I had Cujo on for the very first Epic Live stream that year, and he did a gag with me that was Sound is Essential. Well, if you haven't watched it, I'll put the video link right up there so you can watch my Sound is Essential entry. But the the video itself, the information and, and the little gags and things I said in it hold true. I mean, sound is absolutely essential. And whether you are able to concentrate on sound for a particular shot or not, like we were talked about in the last, last uh, uh, segment here, is indeed something you have to keep in mind of. But you've got to always remember that sound is indeed essential. Fighting for good sound is something that you need to, to be uh, constantly on your toes about when it's shutting down noises, when it's making sure you can get a, lo uh, a lav mic on everyone that speaks and get a plant on them if it's going to gain you something. Uh, and if, it's, uh, if, if you're putting a boom on someone, then absolutely you want to make sure that sounds great as well. Uh, and I say if you could put a boom on someone, that's for the setup. I mean, it may be a wide shot and you can't do it or something like that in the situ situation. One of the things that, and the analogies that I've used in the past uh, when I've taught classes is, is I've said that if your boom is like the equivalent of a Five Guys or let's say a Ted's Montana Grill burger and uh, it's going to be really good and your lav mic might be something, you know, that's still good, like a, a, a good, you know, cook to order Burger King burger of some sort. You know, it's still good. It's not great by any means, but it's, it's good. It's a good burger. You know, why are you going to want to add a plant in there if all you're going to get is a McDonald's value meal out of it? You know, if, uh, if all you could do is throw the same microphone that's on as a boom, but it's going to be five feet away from your actor and you're going to at least be able to get something, but it's not going to be great by any means. And if you can't put a lob on them, it will be at least a Burger King burger as opposed to McDonald's value meal burger that's far away. Post, you know, people, some people will say, throw it in there. Post is going to appreciate uh, having the options. Well, they're not going to want to have a McDonald's value meal option if there is a Five Guys or Ted's Montana Grill Burger available to them, will they? Not unless they're five years old. In that case, then maybe, but, you know, not normally. Now, this is kind of an intro to the whole sound is essential thing, and let the truth be know, known, I personally believe that sound is over half of the experience of watching a movie or television show. Some people may argue that it's, well, it's half. I mean, you got your audio and you got your visuals. Yes, but how often do you go and watch a movie or TV show and they say, do not obstruct, obstruct the view of the person in front of you, silence your cell phones, people don't want to listen to talking, that kind of thing. It's because when you watch a show, you are trying to listen to the story, the text that the actors have, uh, have, have been performing that was written by the, the writers, that text is what's going to keep the story going forward. If you're doing some action while you're watching a movie and you're, you're looking down and I always use crocheting because I remember fond memories of my grandmother crocheting and she was watching TV shows and movies with me, but she'd be crocheting something and looking at that. But, you know, obviously, not everybody knits and crochets and that kind of thing, but let's just use that as an example. You're crocheting and your hands are, uh, are you know, busy and you're looking down at that and you're hearing something on the movie or TV show, you're able to follow the story pretty well. But if there's something that happens, you'll pause crocheting, look up and look at the screen. But if there is, if you're watching a movie and your friend calls 
and you hit mute and you continue to watch the movie while you are talking to them on the phone, you're not going to be able to concentrate on the story and hear what's going on and seeing what's going on. Otherwise, you're going to be tuning out your friend. And in which case, at the very end of it, you're going to have to probably rewind back the movie or TV show just to see what happened. You're going to have to go back and do it. Before we had DVRs and the ability to pause live TV or streaming content or something like that, we used to have to have a VCR tape ready on the ready so that way if uh, a friend called, we'd have to quickly throw that tape into record mode so that way we could record what it was that we were trying to watch until one of our friends, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and you had had your conversation. But that's the, the, the plain and simple thing is that sound without picture is still radio and you have a story, but picture without sound is surveillance. When, when you're doing a shot and there's a fight scene and, and uh, something going on, sometimes directors of photography, they, they say, I want to hear sound too. Or they'll, they'll insist on having a contact. The reason why is because they understand that if people have context and they're listening, they're, that most of the time people are going to be less critical about their picture. And things also sell differently when there is sound and picture combined. So like, I always use the movie Rocky as an example. I've loved watching the Rocky movies throughout the years. Whenever you would have them stacked, where one person was like, you were looking over the shoulder and they're throwing punches at someone else, or the person was throwing back punches, you always had the action of the person that's being punched, they'd snap their head as if they're getting hit. But if they ever rotated around where you were looking at them profile, guess what happened? They didn't do the sound effect and throw it in there, but the actors were still moving and faking like they got hit, or they could have been dodging the, the punch. But since you don't hear the sound, you are not hearing that and therefore saying, oh, he just got hit. You see that he didn't get hit because the, 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 the punch was thrown about, you know, six, eight inches in front of their face. And you say, oh, he didn't hit him and therefore you don't hear the sound. When they get into post and they're adding the sound effect, they're not gonna add it if it, if it was a miss. Because then it's gonna have people like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. And then they're gonna go back and pause it and say, that he didn't hit him and suddenly ends up on the IMDB as a, as a you know, goof up or something like that in production. But a lot of the times you'll end up having an impact of a, of a gunshot, like in a movie, really driven home because you'll get to hear it, you know, fall away you know over a long distance it's going to sound like it was a big huge massive impact uh in walking dead the very first episode when rick grimes crawls himself into a tank you know this isn't the spoiler but technically i guess it is and uh one of the the soldiers inside there reanimates as a walker looks at him and he shoots the gun you hear ringing you hear you see the look on his face but it sells the fact that uh that he just had was inside of this little tin can when he shot his gun and it just it just shook his head up. It just totally like messes up his brain because he shot a gun inside of a closed tank. And that was, you know, what happened. But if you hit pause or you hit mute rather, and you're watching that exact same action, but you know, he, uh, uh, and, and you know, you saw the look on his face, it would still sell, but not the same thing as when you hear that sound that's just a punch to your head. And then you hear the ringing and you're like, man, we all know that sound. That's when it really drives home. And that's when it's like, geez, is he ever going to recover? Is he ever going to be able to hear again? That's the kind of thing that really takes it to the next level. And that's because sound is essential. And because sound is one of those things that you need to have to carry the story. Sometimes a visual, it can play in darkness. A gag, you can hear the sound. And that's like, what's going on? What's going on in this scary movie? And, you know, there's a lot of creative DPs out there that will silhouette something or put something in blue light if they find that it's a night shot or something like that. But I tell you, there's something very sub subliminal and s cerebral that gets in your head when somebody is doing something and all you hear is the sound. It really drives home the point very clearly. So there you have it. Another episode of the Speed Bumps podcast in the can. We are just rocking away with these speed bumps, aren't we? And, uh... I tell you, it's, it's really cool to be able to tackle a, to a topic and to just run free with it and uh, free-spirited talk about it and see what happens. But regardless, I appreciate you tuning in and uh, joining me on this episode of Speed Bumps. And I welcome you to tune in to uh, more additional episodes in the future. In two weeks, we'll have another episode. But in the meantime, 
Thank you very much for joining, and I will see you around. If you'd like to ask a sound-related question to be answered in a future episode, send text, audio, or video to ssp at soundspeeds.us. Want to record this outro? Details in the description below. Find us on social media and online at www.soundspeeds.us. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for more sound-related content.